welcome to, to our Facebook live session. I'm going to quickly share my screen. Right, the time now is 7 p.m. Thank you all for tuning in uh, to our webinar session today on estate planning. Uh, and let's, uh, once again, I just want to uh, thank all of you for taking time during this uh, weekday evening to, to join us as well. So hopefully uh, today's session will be beneficial to all of you, right? Uh, and hopefully I'll be able to share uh, most of the information as relevant uh, to this uh, part about estate planning as well. All right. So today, because it's going to be a Facebook live session, um, you can make use of the uh, the chat, the, the comment box, right? Uh, to if you ask, uh, if you have any questions to ask, uh, feel free to uh, use the comment box as well. So for those of you who are already in um, in the in the in the Facebook live session, please feel free to uh, say hi, right? And um, uh, don't be shy. Uh, and today uh, we'll, we also have a few colleagues together with me uh, who will be on hand to help answer your questions as well, all right? Now, uh, in order to honor some, all of your time today, I think let's, uh, let's begin. Today's session. My name is Albert, and I am a financial literacy trainer and also a client advisor with Money Our World. So I'll be giving us the sharing on today's session. All right. And before we begin, uh, let me just quickly uh, share with us on some of the things to, to take note, especially with all of the workshops today. Right, um, and especially when it comes to estate planning, sometimes uh, estate planning and will writing can be a very complex uh, process, right? So please do seek uh, legal advice if you have more complicated um, needs and requests. Um, and feel free to drop us an email at inquiries at moneyourworld.com.sg for a referral service uh, to a professional will writing service, right? And Today's session really is more for a general sharing of uh, information in the area of estate planning and will writing. Okay, so uh, not to worry, I'll be sharing with us the, the email address to get in contact with us for those of you who uh, have a need to. Okay, now before I begin today's session, allow me to just spend some time uh, and introduce who Money Hour is, right? As for some of you who uh, it may be the first time that you are hearing of us, Money Our World. Uh, I, I do. I may have some uh, of our existing clients uh, who are here with us today. So do feel free to say hi in in the in the Facebook uh, comment box. All right, uh, and uh, be uh, just make yourself comfortable. All right now, who is Money Our World? We are basically a financial advisor and fund management company licensed by the MES. Now, we are a joint venture between NTUC Enterprise and Provident, Singapore's first fee-only financial advisor. Now, Provident and NTUC have several decades of doing right and doing good. And at Money Our World, we continue to build on this heritage to serve people like yourself by helping them make wise money decisions easily and confidently. So through workshops like this, we hope to uh, reach out to more people uh, to share this information. Uh, and you can also choose to engage in our comprehensive financial planning service, whereby you will gain access to a competent uh, and conflict-free financial advisor who are salary-based, right? Uh, and they are not uh, in a position to have to feel to that there's a need to, to sell you expensive uh, products as well. And we call ourselves a bionic financial advisor, uh, meaning we actually make use of technology uh, to augment our human operations. Right? So at the core of it, really, we are a financial advisor. We are human advisors uh, talking to you. Uh, but we make use of technology in a lot of our operations. And today, we will be actually seeing one of our technology platforms which is the wheel writing service, which I'm quite excited to share with uh, all of us today. 
All right. Now, what are we going to be talking about today? There are a few areas. Now, in order for us to get started talking about this topic of estate planning, I know it's not a very exciting topic, uh, but we do have to acknowledge that this is a very important topic uh, that we need to talk about at some point in, in time, right? Especially uh, today, if you have financial dependence on you, you have young children, uh, or you have elderly uh, dependents uh, like your parents, right? Uh, we need to talk about what happens to your assets upon death, right? And we need to discuss what if today I die without uh, writing a will, if I haven't got my estate planning done uh, appropriately, uh, what are some of the issues that may arise in the situation of uh, intestacy? And also, we need to talk about the area of estate planning that is not covered under your wills, all right? And before I go on a little bit further, I just want to take this time. I understand that there could be uh, some of our viewers today uh, who are uh, actually Muslims, right? So today's sharing, I will not be going in detail on the Muslim estate uh, planning portion uh, because you will need to have a, a Sharia compliant um, will writer to, to help you with that as well. Uh, and I'm not Sharia compliant. So please do, uh, if you need more advice on uh, that area, please feel free to get in touch with us. We also have uh, referrals to uh, Sharia compliant uh, will writing services as well. Okay. Uh, and, and definitely for our uh, Muslim viewers today, uh, this will serve as good information uh, for us as well, right? And um, uh, why is it important? Uh, and Muslims can also write uh, their wills as well um, to distribute to their non uh, Farai beneficiaries. Okay. And after sharing the information today, all the theory, uh, what we are going to do is I will bring us through uh, an activity uh, using our platform and to show us how easy it is to write a will for yourself if you haven't already done so. So hopefully by the end of today, I will be able to get you thinking, uh, get you started on this process. Now, especially if you have been thinking about it for the longest time, procrastinating on it, uh, not sure how to go about doing it. Uh, I hope that today's session uh, will be a good time for you to uh, get started. Okay, and I will show all of us actually, uh, it's going to be a very simple uh, process. It's not going to take more than 10 to 15 minutes if you have all your information ready on hand. All right, so I, I hope this is enough uh, to get us excited about this pretty grim topic. Uh, and trust me, it's going to be quite a uh, quite a light topic, I'll try and make it as easy for us to uh, understand as possible uh, in, a, in a very systematic manner. And I'll be happy to share, um, you know, uh, if, if you have any questions at all. Yeah, but once again, I, I do urge you to make use of the, the comments box in, in your Facebook, right, to drop us a question. I have my colleagues on hand with me, uh, and we will be happy to answer any questions you may have along the way. Now, I may have, there may be some uh, situations like your personal situations, which may tend to be a little bit complicated, we perhaps may have to take that offline as well. Okay, now let's jump straight in. Now, before even talking about estate planning, we need to talk about what happens upon death in Singapore specifically, right? So as we are working today uh, and as we are saving and accumulating our assets, we accumulate quite a fair bit of uh, different types of assets uh, in our working lives. And today, if we are a business owner, some of us today, we could own uh, our own businesses, self-employed individuals. Your business is part of your personal assets, right? Uh, personal assets could also include things like your house, your property, uh, your car. Sometimes we maybe even have um, personal assets such as your prized jewelry, you could also have antique collections, right? Um, today, it's not, su uh, not surprising that people may keep uh, even gold as well. Uh, so these all come under your personal assets. Everything that you own under your name uh, will be considered your personal assets. Now, part of your whole assets also includes life insurance, right? So life insurance also forms part of this uh, asset pool 
as well. And finally, in Singapore, we also have a very big pool of assets that comes in the form of our CPF, right? Uh, and today, if you are a Singaporean and a PR and you're listening into this webinar, I'm sure that CPF is actually go going to form quite a substantial part of your personal assets as well. All right. Now, what happens upon death is all these personal assets of yours is going to flow through a funnel that you can see uh, on your on the screens now, right? And this will then in turn translate to your estate. So why is it that we call it estate planning and not asset planning? Now, simply because they refer to the same things at different point in time. Uh, so estate represents your assets after death, right? Assets is when you are alive. So you can do your assets planning when you're still alive. But upon death, what will happen is all your assets become your estate. From your estate, your beneficiaries will get a part of it, right? Now, why do I say your beneficiaries uh, will only get part of it and not all of it? Now, unfortunately, in this funnel that channels your estate to your beneficiaries, there is a siphon in the middle, right? There is a siphon that will leak away certain costs in your estate planning process. Now, the first principle of estate planning is preservation. We need to know and we need to identify where are these leakages happening and we need to preserve as much of our estate as possible. Now, let me share with us what are some examples of leakages to our estate upon our death, okay? Now, estate duty. I know some of us in this room today, we know today in Singapore, we do not have estate duty. I will speak more about estate duty later on, okay? It depends on a few other considerations as well, but generally uh, in Singapore today, we no longer impose uh, estate duty. The second leakage would be in terms of the legal and probate costs uh, that is required in the distribution of your estate, right? So let me give an example of the types of costs that can be uh, ranging uh, in, the, if, in the case of an estate distribution. Now, let's say today, if you have a will written and you go through the probate process, okay, through the courts to file for the um, necessary documents, the grant of probates, the cost is typically in the regions of about 1,000 to about 1,500 Singapore dollars, depending on the complexity of your estate. Now, the more complex your estate is, the higher the legal and probate costs. Now, today, if you were to act via a law firm, right, a, a lawyer, uh, definitely the lawyer is going to charge you a slightly higher premium for to act on behalf to act on your behalf, right? So today I could have two separate, um, uh, two separate persons, uh, maybe a person A with uh, total assets of say 1 million Singapore dollars, uh, but that 1 million Singapore dollars is all in one single bank account in Singapore. Compared to a second person, a person B, who probably has, let's say, $500,000, Singapore dollars, but this $500,000 is being spread all over uh, the, the different countries, right? Okay, let's say um, this person has 200,000 of investments in Malaysia, okay? And maybe uh, 100,000 of um, investments in Hong Kong, for example. Then he has uh, the remainder in a few other bank accounts within Singapore itself. So it's not just one single bank account. Now, the person with the simpler estate is going to incur a lower legal probate cost, right? Because the, for the very simple reason, the number of uh, letters that you need to send to the various banks to check, you know, to do all the paperwork that is required uh, and also to send to uh, other countries as well. So. In short, right, for legal and probate costs, just bear in mind it is down to the simplicity or rather the complexity of your estate, okay? Uh, and that is also one consideration when we talk about estate planning as well, when um, we are near 
uh, towards our um, the, the later years, right? We we want to also plan ahead and to make sure that we want to start consolidating our assets uh, when there is a need to. Right now, let's talk about medical bills in Singapore. We are quite blessed um, in the sense we get to seek treatment before we make a payment uh, to the hospitals. Yeah. So we will not be rejected uh, medical treatment if we are unable to afford. Um, so there will be many, many layers of uh, safety nets involved. However, the thing is in Singapore, medical bills will not be waived upon your death, right? Your estate will need to pay off the last medical bills for you. So it's important to bear in mind uh, medical costs as well. And I will talk about this a little bit more in detail uh, in the later slides. Now let's talk about income tax. This is another form of a leakage to your estate. Now, some of you may be thinking today, if I die a natural death at the age of say 90 years old, I no longer earn an income, then yes, uh, you're absolutely right. If you know, if you have no more liabilities for income tax, you do not need uh, to pay off. Your estate does not need to pay off this income tax. However, today, if you died a sudden death and you are still actively working and you still have accumulated some income tax that you have unpaid from the previous year of your employment. Uh, this will then need to be considered uh, in, as, a, as a form of a leakage from your estate. All right, so that's the part on income tax. Then we need to move on to the next, which is your creditors. Now, who are creditors? Creditors are basically people whom you borrow money from, and I'm not I'm not really referring to the you know the, the loan sharks and, and things like that. Yeah, uh, I'm referring to the legal money lenders. Yeah, the banks, the banks whom you borrow money to pay off your housing loans, things like that. Um, creditors will have first claim to your estate before your beneficiaries get. Uh, any money at all, right? So bear in mind that all these leakages, they have a first claim to your estate, even before your family members uh, stand to get any um, money at all, right? So do take note of that any outstanding loans uh, will need to be paid. Finally, we also need to talk about this. It's, mm, it's one of the most important that I need to share, uh, and it comes in the form of funeral expenses. Now, funeral expenses in Singapore can widely vary depending on your religion, right? So your religious beliefs will determine what type of a funeral expense cost you are going to incur, or rather your estate is going to incur. Now, I just want to pause for a while and let us think, now, which is the religion that typically incurs the higher uh, funeral expenses. Does anyone want to make a guess? Feel free to use the uh, Facebook comments. Uh, LN Cole, you mentioned Buddhist um, close guest, right? Um, it is uh, close. Oh, Chunting, thanks. It's a good guest, Chunting. You got it, right? Uh, it's, it's typically uh, a Taoist, right? Um, Buddhist is a close second as well. Uh, and basically, uh, it's all down to your religious uh, beliefs, the funeral rites that you need to perform at, at the funeral. So it could really go, uh, oh, Terence, I think there's a typo there, <laughs> Taoist, right? I think you meant to uh, refer to Taoist as well. No, exactly. Uh, so depending on your religious uh, beliefs, uh, it, will, it will affect your amount of the funeral expenses that you incur as well. Now on the other flip side of the costing in terms of your final expenses, we need to look at the Muslims as well, right? So I, 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 I'm expecting that we could have some Muslims 
uh, listening in to us today. So typically for a Muslim funeral expense, because of the Sharia law, you are not allowed to embalm the bodies, right? And burial has to be done within 24 hours. And, and therefore typically funeral expenses are uh, typically funeral expenses are, are more affordable for a Muslim uh, funeral. All right, so that's things to take note in the areas of leakages. Thank you all for responding, right? And uh, going forward, I'm going to ask a few more questions as well tonight. All right, and feel free to participate uh, as we go along and it will make this whole session a little bit uh, more interactive. Now, we want to uh, we want to make sure we minimize all these leakages so that we can maximize what our beneficiaries can get uh, in the end, right? And this is so that we, our beneficiaries, our loved ones, our family members can continue to live and maintain the same standard of living as if you were still there, right? As if you are still uh, uh, there as well. No. The next part of an estate plan is very important. We need to create an estate. And there is really only one tool in estate creation. And I'm specifically referring to insurance. Now, insurance is a tool of estate creation. What is the purpose of estate creation? It's basically to ensure that you have sufficient capital to take care of these leakages to make sure that your beneficiaries are well taken care of. Therefore, when you talk about insurance planning, when we calculate how much insurance we need to buy, actually, we also need to factor in uh, estate planning as part of your insurance uh, planning process as well. Now, in Singapore, we are very blessed to have many choices uh, in life. And when we die in Singapore, uh, we also have a choice to die in Singapore. There are two ways that we can die in Singapore, and that is the estate distribution part. Right? Does anyone know what are the two ways that we can die in Singapore? There are only two ways. In the eyes of the law in Singapore, what are the two ways that we can pass away in Singapore? Does anyone want to make a guess? Okay, now I know some of you may be thinking, oh, I can, I can die either natural death or uh, due to a suicide. I can die from an illness or, ah, thank you, Grace. Um, natural or unnatural. Ah, yes, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, Kesha, you said natural and unnatural as well. Yes, Jim, you got the uh, correct answer. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much. Natural and uh, suicide, uh, that's not uh, what I'm looking for. So I think, Jim, you got the correct uh, answer that I was looking for. In the eyes of the law in Singapore, right, the estate can be distributed either intestate or testate. All right. Now, these are very big terms. These are very big legal terms. Now, what do they mean? Exactly. Thank you very much, uh, Terence. One means to say you die without a will, and that is to die intestate. Okay? If I die today without writing a will, I die intestate. Today, if I die with a will written, I die testate. The person who writes the will, or rather the person who uh, do does up the will, you are called a testator. So you are the testator to your own will. All right, now let's take a deeper look at these three parts of estate planning. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lina. Die rich or die poor. <laughs> exactly. That is also a very important part uh, that we need to discuss uh, when we talk about estate planning as well. Now, what is the objective of estate planning? There are three main objectives. And allow me to summarize and cap it up uh, before we move on. Number one, we, we need to preserve our estate so that we can maximize how much our beneficiaries are getting. Number two, we need to create sufficient capital for our beneficiaries, our loved ones, our family members 
and to also take care of the, the estate expenses that I was talking about in the previous slide. And lastly, the distribution portion. Now, this is the easiest part in estate planning, deciding who to give to in whatever percentages. Right? Usually, the more difficult part will come in when I need to look at guardians, trustees, which I'll talk more about uh, a little later. All right. So preservation, creation, thereafter, distribution. So these are the objectives in estate planning. Now, let me dive deep into two areas. The, the first area would be estate duty. Now, in, in Singapore, we no longer have estate duty. It was abolished since 2008, right? However, it is important to bear in mind today, if you own overseas assets, for example, today, most of us would have some form of investments here and there all over the world, right? We have global, globally diversified uh, investments. Now, today, uh, let me give us an example. Uh, if, if you have certain assets, you own a property, uh, in the UK, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, the United Kingdom is one of the countries that actually charge a pretty high inheritance tax. So estate duty has another name. It's also known as an inheritance tax. So inheritance tax in the UK is about 40%. And it is charged on the part of your estate that is above the threshold. So they, they, they have a threshold amount, which is 325 thousand dollars so it's similar to uh, in Singapore we have a threshold limit of four hundred thousand in our uh, SRS accounts for those of you who know right so that part uh, within the three hundred and twenty five thousand uh, pounds uh, you do not need to pay uh, estate duty or inheritance tax thereafter you will be charged uh, forty percent and forty percent is really quite a big uh, amount of uh, leakage. So bear in mind as well, if you own a property, if you own investments, uh, and that example is in the UK. Now today you could have um, investments in other countries uh, as well. So please take note of these uh, implications if you do own overseas uh, estate as well. Right? Of course, there are other things to take note uh, depending on your personal situation as well and the whole um, Yeah. Okay. Now, today, if you are a citizen of another country, you today, if you are a citizen of another country, definitely, uh, depending on your home country, you may be subject to estate duty as well, right? But um, I hope today, most of us who are listening in to this uh, webinar session, uh, you would be. Uh, either Singaporeans or PRs. And in Singapore, uh, if you are a Singaporean or a PR, uh, the, if there is no estate duty uh, that will be charged on your estate. Now, let's move on to talk a little bit more in detail uh, in the area of your medical expenses, right? In terms of medical expenses, I would like to, uh, I would like to highlight that based on MOH statistics, right, more than half of the annual deaths that are recorded in Singapore are due to a major medical uh, illness, right? So there are a few major causes of death in Singapore as well. Now, if I were, if I had a little bit more time, I would like to also, uh, you know, uh, pose this question to, the, to all of you who are listening in uh, tonight, right? And just make a quick guess uh, how many deaths are there in, in Singapore each year? Uh, and, and there is about 20,000, right? So if we were to look uh, through things that about 20,000 deaths occur in Singapore each year and about half of it is due to a major illness and medical costs in Singapore can be astronomical. And by astronomical, I really mean a very, very big sum of money can be incurred, especially if today you are sick for a very long time and you require a long-term hospitalization. Now, I want to stress that we need to make sure we have the correct type of insurance that will pay for your medical bills. Today, most of us, we tend to spend quite a fair bit on insurance, but when it comes to the time whereby we need it the most, we may come across, uh, uh, get a root shock that all this insurance that I have been paying for does not pay for my medical bills. Specifically, I'm referring to your integrated shield plans. Now, 
Not to worry if you are unsure, please do feel free to drop us a message uh, or get in touch. Uh, with our client advisor, we'll be happy to uh, bring you through an insurance review as well, or you may want to uh, try out our comprehensive financial planning service to make sure that you have the appropriate type of insurances in place uh, that will take care of all these uh, leakages in specifically, I'm referring to your medical expenses. Now, today, what if you die in Singapore without writing a will? Fortunately or unfortunately, the government has written a will for us. Specifically, this is for the non-Muslim estates. Okay, uh, For the Muslims, your equivalent would be the inheritance certificate. Now, that one, you will have to go to Sharia court and you will have to do a trial calculation. It's going to be a very complicated process. So do seek advice, uh, either from your religious leaders um, or the relevant uh, legal professionals. Yeah? Now, let me talk a little bit about Intestate Succession Act. I would like all of you to look at this way of distribution and think about it. Is this a fair way of distribution? Now, some of you may be asking me, hey, what is this asterisk issue? What is issue? All right, now issue represents your children and your grandchildren. It represents your bloodline. So now today, if they are going to list down your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, okay, not enough space. Yeah? So they replace the whole thing with an umbrella term. Okay. Uh, okay, Alan says it's fair. <laughs> okay. Uh, think about it, right? Sherry, not fair. Now, I will share with us an example uh, in a bit. Now, back to this issue. So today, if you have children, you have your grandchildren, basically your bloodline, right? Your bloodline, it represents uh, issue. Now, allow me to just very quickly talk about uh, this part on intestate succession. And as with uh, a lot of our laws in Singapore, uh, tends to have its roots in the British laws. And in the Caucasian culture, you realize that there is no such thing as filial piety. Uh, so if you were to refer to this, the parents only come in when you are married without children. Yeah, allow me to change my pointer. Yeah. So parents only come in if you are married uh, without children. Now, let's move down the list. If you are married, Today, your parents are no longer around and you do not have any children. Your spouse will get everything, okay? Today, if you are married with children, with or without parents, meaning if you are married with children, whether or not your parents are still around, they will not get anything, right? Or your spouse will get half of it. Your children will get half to be shared equally. Now, today, if you leave behind only your children without your spouse around, you do not have your parents as well, your children will get all of it. So you realize that once you have formed a family nucleus on your own, all the focus is now on your immediate family nucleus. Yeah? So your parents will only come in if today you are in this situation, right? You are married, your parents are still around, but you do not have any children yet. So newly married, you need to follow this. Your parents will get half, your spouse will get half. Then we move down the list as well. So this is a sequential list. Yeah? So we got to move down the list step by step. The checks will have to be done accordingly. And today, if you are in a situation whereby you only leave behind your parents, you are either a single, you are not married uh, with no children, or if your, your spouse has already passed away and you do not have any children, then your parents will get all of your uh, estate to be shared equally. Your siblings uh, will come next if you do not have any parents around, no spouse and no children. Then it comes to the grandparents and finally it will come to your uncles and aunties. I always like to share this in my workshops and ask uh, the participants, right? Now, what if um, this, these uncles and aunties, they are specifically referring to your blood uncles and blood aunties, right? It's not the uncle, auntie you see in the coffee shop. Yeah, hey, uncle, hey, auntie, right? So uh, do be very clear about that. And often I get this question as well. Uh, is it from the mother's side or is it from the father's side? 
right? So it's actually from both sides. Yeah? Now, I have a question from Bob. This table only applies if you do not leave behind a will. Yes, correct. Thank you, Bob. This table only applies if you die in test state. Okay, so if today you really do not have anyone else to leave it to, um, may I suggest that you can insert me over here before we leave it to the government. I always like to joke about this. We know that our government is quite rich and we really don't want to leave our money uh, for our government, right? So do take this time to, to think about it and whether or not it's fair or not fair. Now, allow me to just quickly change over to my uh, whiteboard. Okay, now let's take a look at an example following the Intestate Succession Act, right? And let's say today I have an example of a newly married couple and they wanted to go on a holiday, a honeymoon together, right? So, bear with my drawing, okay? Uh, it's not easy to do this <laughs> virtually, but I'll try and uh, share it. Okay, in the best way that I can. Now, this newly married couple, okay, um, they are quite well to do, right? And let's say uh, both of them start off with 1 million of estate and they decided to go on a holiday together because they are newly married couple, they don't have children. They don't have children, right? And both of them have their parents around. Okay, so unfortunately in the plane ride, the plane crashed. Now, in a plane crash, both of them died together. And because both of them did not write a will, okay, no wills written, no wills written, who would have died first? In order for me to follow the Intestate Succession Act, somebody has to die first, right? Because the money will need to be distributed uh, in a certain way according to the table that we saw just now. Now, in this situation, when they went on a plane together in a plane crash, and unfortunately, if they died together, who is deemed to have died first? Usually, I will be getting uh, responses such as the men will die first because men deserve to die first, <laughs> right? And the, the men will say the ladies will die first because they are um, live a very stressful life and things like that, right? Um, can be a very interactive uh, discussion as well, right? Now, if I were to add in an age, to it. And let's say the man is 35 and the lady is 30, 33 years old, okay? The older one is deemed to have died first in a common disaster. So this is what we call a common disaster, right? So in the event, oh, make sure, yeah, you say male because of shorter, shorter life expectancy. Uh, not really because of shorter life expectancy, uh, but really it's uh, due to um, yeah, the law saying that the older one is deemed to have died first. Now, in the event uh, that the, the man dies first, what will happen is that this share of his estate, the one million will be split half. Yeah? So half of it, which is 500,000, will go to the parents split equally. So his dad will get 250,000, his mom will get 250,000. And the other 500,000 will be given to the spouse, right? Because the spouse died second. So now the spouse will get 1.5 million and her parents will now get the full share of this 1.5 million dollars. Now, is this a fair or not a fair way of distribution. I leave that to 
uh, you guys to think about it, right? Uh, clearly, it may not be the most fair method of distributing, but th there's also a few other considerations as well, not just whether it's, it's fair or not fair. Similarly, today, if the situation is whereby the female is the older one, the female is deemed to have died first, and the uh, men's parents will definitely be getting more of the estate share. Okay, now, what if a situation whereby the both of them are the same age? I always get this question uh, a lot in a lot of my workshops. Now, if I if I say, <laughs> Grace, yeah, the moral of the story, marry somebody who is older. <laughs> yeah. um, but really, uh, today, if both of them are the same age, born in the same year, born in the same month, and born on the same day, same hour, same minute, Wow, I tell you, that is a match made in heaven. Uh, this is really, you know, I born at the same time with you and then I died on the same time uh, with you. Right? Uh, so far, there hasn't been any case laws that, um, that, that is uh, known that you have this couple who is exactly the same age. Right? Definitely, there will be some difference uh, in the, the timings uh, of their births as well. Okay, now, let me quickly jump back to my presentation. Right. Yeah, Elaine, you have a question. Yeah? Uh, can niece and nephew be uh, under the intestate? So unfortunately, you have pointed out something that is quite important, right? Sometimes we may want to leave for people who are not within this intestate uh, succession act as well. So niece and nephews are not included. Yeah? Niece and nephews are not uh, included in the intestate succession act. Similarly, your um, some sometimes we may have helpers within our family who live with us for a very long time. We may want to give them a, a gift, right? We may want to leave something for them as a token of appreciation. Uh, and maybe sometimes we also have a cause that we strongly believe in and we might want to leave it to a charitable organization. So these are instances whereby the Interstate Succession Act uh, does not cater for, right? So we have to bear in mind as well, it's not just the manner of distribution, which may not be what we want to, uh, uh, to, to distribute, right? Now, what are some of the other issues, right? Not just because it uh, is not the way you intend to distribute, you may incur higher costs as well. In fact, you will incur higher uh, legal costs. Yeah. Now, why is it so? Um, because, oh, Misha, you asked a question, step siblings, right? Now, if they are legally adopted children, uh, then it is fine. Step siblings uh, after a, a remarriage will not uh, fall under the Intestate Succession Act, right? Unless they are legally adopted. Okay, good question. Thanks for that, uh, Misha. Yeah. yeah, so long as they are legal uh, siblings, okay? So there will be higher legal costs uh, involved as well, okay, because you will need to go through the whole administration process without a will, um, and uh, this will potentially be a big problem as well. There definitely is going to be a delay in your beneficiaries getting your monies, right? Uh, because it's going to take a longer process. Uh, in the case of an intestate death, there will need to be your family members will need to go to court to appoint themselves as administrators, right? And therefore, uh, there's going to be a, a big delay when it comes to this. Now, the more important part really is for the parents. If you're a parent today, uh, listening into our webinar, today, if you have children who are minors, who are minors, minors are basically um, children who are under the age of 21 uh, in Singapore. So the age of majority in Singapore is 21. If you die intestate today and you leave behind minor children, you will then need, the administrator will then need to find administration bonds and surety. So basically, these are the guarantors to your to the, to the administrator. Yeah? So for example, uh, let me just give a quick example. Today, if you die leaving behind a $500,000 estate, Okay, you will need to find two surety bonds if the administrator, uh, if the 
if the deceased leaves behind uh, minor children, the administrator will then need to find two charity bonds with their own assets totaling to the amount of estate uh, that is required by that's required by, by the court, right? Because uh, for a very simple reason, to protect the, the minor children as well, uh, in for fear that the administrator may run away uh, with the money. Yeah. So uh, if you have a $500,000 estate, you will need to find two different um, charity bonds with assets totaling $500,000 each. So in all, you need $1 million uh, uh, total assets for both of the uh, charity bonds. Right? So this is going to be a very challenging process, especially if you are uh, talking about uh, much bigger uh, estates. Right? So definitely, the, if you were to die in the state, it's going to be a more complicated process. It's going to be a much longer uh, process as well. Yeah? Yeah, therefore, it is important for us to write a will. Now, I hope most of us who are listening in today, we either have written a will and we are listening in for you know more knowledge, you know, to, to revisit this topic again. Uh, and for those of you who are thinking of writing a will, now why is it important? Because you get to distribute according to your own wishes, you minimize the conflict, right? You minimize conflict because if you leave without setting proper instructions, your loved one may get into certain conflicts uh, when it comes to money. Money is a thing that could tear families apart right? if you do not state your wishes clearly. Definitely with the will, the probate process is going to be much faster. You avoid delay and you avoid problems related to a common disaster as well, as I mentioned in the previous example through my whiteboard. Right? So if both of the parents die together, you will need definitely to have a will, which has a clause that states in the event of a common disaster, who is going to, you know, what is going to be done to your young children as well. Okay, now allow me to uh, just quickly share this uh, quick um, part about the Money Hour Will Writing Service that it's a simple will and it doesn't cater for the common disaster clause. So if you have a very specific request and you feel that this is important and you want to add it to your will, uh, please do get in touch with us. And we do have a referral to a professional will writing service who can help you with that as well in the common disaster, all right? Now, I mentioned just now that that the most difficult part of a will writing process is really not the distribution. Distribution is nothing but a, num a set of numbers and percentages, right? Out of 100%, how many percent is your child going to get? How many percent is your spouse going to get? If you are single, how many percent is your um, nieces and nephews going to get? Your elderly parents and so on and so forth. Now for parents, the most difficult decision, and this always occurs with a lot of uh, people whom I meet, right? They tell me that the guardians are the most difficult to appoint. Why? Because today, who are the best guardians for your children? If you think about it, you are the best guardian for your children. So in a common disaster, when both parents go together, this is a very challenging situation. It, if you do not appoint in through a will, the courts will appoint for you and the courts go by logic, right? So if you have siblings, most likely they will go through the siblings first. But let's say in an example whereby you may not be on talking terms with your siblings. Maybe your siblings are overseas, right? And that could cause a lot of problems as well. So do think about it, but a lot of times we also meet with a lot of our clients who sit on it for too long. And because they are thinking of who is the best guardian for their children, they end up procrastinating and they end up not having a will written at all. So the good thing is I want to urge all of us, especially the parents who are listening in today, if you are still thinking about it, just put in maybe your best friend first, right? It may not be the best guardian, but at least get started with a simple will. Thereafter, uh, one of the good things is that uh, the money over will allows you to make as many edits as you want, okay? Uh, and I'll be happy to share that uh, later with all of us. And we need to 
also indicate who we want to carry out our will, and these are called the executors to our wills. Lastly, we need to appoint people to take care of the money for our minor children, and these are called the trustees to our will. All right. Now, before I go on to the, the activity where I want to share our um, will writing robo with all of us, I thought it was also important to highlight this point that not everything is covered under our wills. Now, what are not covered includes jointly held assets. Yeah, what could be jointly held assets? Um, I have a question. Is it worth to make a will if estate value is less uh, or equivalent? Now, uh, Leo, you have a very good question. Yeah. So today, if you have a very small amount, if it is less than, um, I can't remember clearly, um, well, I think my colleagues will be able to uh, get that for you. I believe it's 50,000, if I remember correctly. Um, the whole probate process uh, will be will be waived off uh, for you. Yeah, but allow, allow my colleagues to, to check and get back uh, to you on that, right? So back to this, the joint bank accounts, joint investment accounts, will not be covered by the will. In this situation, the rule of survivorship will take over, right? So if one of the joint account owners uh, dies, the surviving account owner will take over. Joint tenancy, today, most of us, we own HDBs via joint tenancy. So joint tenancy also, and the rule of survivorship will take over as well. Okay, you cannot will a jointly tenanted uh, property away. CPF is not covered under the will. So for those of us who have not made CPF nominations, please do uh, go ahead and make a CPF nomination. Now, there are certain insurance nominations, which I will talk more in detail in the next few slides. Now, CPF can only be done, or rather CPF can only be distributed by the means of a nomination. Today, you can make a CPF nomination online provided your witnesses have a sync pass to log in. Uh, and basically, if you do not make a CPF nomination, it will follow the Interstate Succession Act for non-Muslims, the Inheritance Certificate for Muslims. Um, we also need to look at what within the CPF is covered and not covered under nominations. Yeah. Now, what is covered? All of your savings in your CPF, your ordinary account, your special account, Medisave, if you're above 55, your retirement account will be covered under CPF nomination. If you have started your CPF life payouts, the undistributed CPF life will follow your nominations as well. Uh, if in the past you have purchased any private annuities with your CPF savings, they will follow the uh, nomination. And lastly, if you happen to be in a group whereby you got access to this discounted Singtel shares uh, in the 90s, in the early 90s, right? Discounted Singtel shares also form part of the CPF nomination as well. Now, what is not covered under the CPF nomination would be your home protection scheme, whereby CPF will actually liaise with, DB, uh, with HDB, okay? And they will pay out accordingly, okay? And uh, CPF investment account. If you have money that is invested outside of uh, CPF through the CPF investment scheme, then that would actually come under your estate, right? It will not come under CPF nomination. Lastly, dependent protection scheme. Right? If you are today below the age of 60, you may still have your dependence protection scheme. That one will be paid out directly, okay? And you will not follow your CPF nomination. Now, I have a question that is it advisable to lodge the will with the will registry? I will talk about that uh, a little bit later on, right? Uh, and unfortunately, there's only one place uh, through the will registry, which is at the Singapore Academy of Law, which I will share a little bit more in detail later. Many of all does not uh, actually provide the, um, the will registry service, okay? Now, just to wrap up very quickly in terms of CPF nomination, what is the default nomination? It's cash, okay? So whatever you have heard before, um, you know, you might have heard some, you might have seen some WhatsApp messages uh, and things like that uh, saying, you know, if you have not made a nomination, it will go to your Medisafe account. Okay, all fake news, huh? right? The default nomination is cash, whereby your nominees will receive in check. 
or GIRO if they already have a bank account that's registered with CPF savings. And this is a very fast process. Typically, it takes about a couple of weeks, right? At most, right? The money will be distributed. The second way you can do a CPF nomination, the second type is an enhanced nomination scheme whereby your nominees will actually get the money in their special or retirement and or Medisafe accounts. Okay, because the purpose of CPF really is for retirement. Therefore, if you feel that you do not want your nominees to get such a big sum of cash money, right? If, any, if you understand that, you know, the, the CPF, I wish I had the chance to talk about CPF interest rates and uh, why we are such a big advocate of using uh, CPF in our retirement planning, you will realize that this may be quite a good option in terms of your CPF nomination to put the money in your nominee's CPF accounts for it to grow at a higher interest rate, right, for their retirement uh, and their healthcare needs as well. Lastly, if you happen to be in the group whereby you have special needs children or parents, you may need uh, to talk to the special needs trust company or what we call SNTC. Special needs trust company will help you administer this special needs savings scheme. So instead of paying out a lump sum to either children with special needs or parents with special needs, special needs trust company will take it and stream it out in the form of a monthly income for uh, these people, special group of um, nominees. Okay, so these are some of the considerations in a CPF nomination. Now, uh, Jim, you have a question. Can the CPF nomination be a combination of cash and CPF accounts? Each nominee can only have one type, okay? So you can give a cash nomination to maybe your son and you can give an enhanced nomination to your daughter, but you cannot have two types of nominations for one nominee, all right? Now, Ariel, oh, thanks for visiting. Uh, thanks for listening in today. How do you check? Basically, you if you have the app on your uh, phone, the My CPF app, you can actually um, check whether or not you have made a nomination. Otherwise, just log into your CPF bot. Okay. All right. Oh, thanks, uh, Yiching. Thanks for the clarification. All right. But the uh, SNTC will be the administrator of the. Uh, S -N -S -S, okay. Now, allow me to quickly talk about the topic of insurance nomination. All right, and this part is actually a lot of a lot of times where people are not too uh, familiar about, right? Um, and before two thousand and nine, there is this confusion uh, regarding insurance nominations, and you see that. I have separated NTUC income policies and all other insurers, right? So prior to 2009, uh, NTUC income, basically even today, they are governed under the Cooperatives and Societies Act, right? And therefore they follow the Cooperatives and Societies Act. Before 2009, there wasn't an insurance act and therefore um, insurance nominations followed the section 73 of the Conveyancing Law and Properties Act. Now, if I were to read this table as myself, right, today, if I buy an NTC income policy before 2009, who can I nominate? I will be able to nominate anyone. It could be my parents. It could be my siblings, right? It could be my cousins or nieces and nephews as well. I can nominate all of the living benefits uh, or rather I will get access to the living benefits. What are living benefits? These are your critical illness payouts. These are your disability payouts. Uh, and so on, right? As the policy owner, I will gain, I will get access to the living benefits. My nominees will get access to the death benefits and these types of nominations are revocable and you can also use a will to take over the distribution of these insurance policies. All other insurance policies, you can only nominate your spouse or children, right? Uh, and the policy owner will not get a share of the living benefits. There is another term for this type of nomination is called a trust nomination. So in a statutory trust, basically what you do is that you give up, you surrender all rights to the policy and basically only your nominees will get 
all of the benefits, be it a living or a death benefit. Now, these type of nominations are irrevocable unless with written consent from all of your nominees. So sometimes it may be quite a difficult situation, especially if you have bought the policy when you were married and if you thereafter divorced, right? You will, the divorce will actually not have any impact on this type of nomination as well, right? So there might be some uh, issues over there as well. And definitely this type of trust nominations will not uh, come under the will as well, okay? Now, you, you, uh, I have a question from uh, Pei Shan, right? If you bought an insurance with AIA or GE before 2009 uh, and the beneficiary has passed on, what should you do? Okay, now it would be definitely a good time for you to do a review and see if there are any other surviving beneficiaries. If you don't do anything to it, uh, actually the payout will be redistributed to the surviving beneficiaries, okay? Uh, now, if it's only a sole beneficiary, meaning there's only one uh, beneficiary and uh, he or she is no longer around, please do make a new nomination, all right? Now, all that con confusion has all been cleared up after 2009, right? Uh, whereby NTUC Income still follows the Cooperatives and Societies Act. Today, we have two new uh, frameworks under the Section 49L of the Insurance Act and Section 49M. So Section 49L essentially is the same as what we have discussed just now. Only your spouse and children can be nominated. You give away all the rights to your policies. Uh, and today you can also make a revocable nomination, which is also known as a Section 49M. All right. Now I understand that today this is going to be quite a lot of information for some of us. Uh, to actually take in in one sitting. Now, I don't expect us to become experts overnight. Uh, it really took me quite a long time as well. Please feel free to get in touch with our client advisors and they will be happy to assist, uh, to give some advice if you have uh, questions like uh, one of our participants uh, as well, right? Uh, like patient's situation. So if you are confused, you're, you bought your policy before 2009, you bought your policy after 2009, you're not sure whether you have done nominations, right? Uh, please do get in touch with us. We'll be happy to assist you accordingly. All right. Now, that's so much on the topics of what is covered, what is not covered. Now, let's come uh, straight to the most exciting part of today. I want to share with all of us. Today, we are actually running a campaign. Right. Today, we are actually running a campaign whereby uh, we are actually giving uh, grab, grab food credits right, for every wheel that is completed. And let me show you how fast it can be to write a wheel, okay? Now, for those of you who are dialing in on your laptops, you might want to also do this together with me. So when you go onto our website, this is what you will see if you go under the services under wheel writing. So what you need to do is just click over here to get a promo code, right? And it will redirect you to the next page whereby you just need to give key in your name and your email address. And what will happen is a uh, promo code will then be sent to your email and you will be able to access the wheel writing service for free uh, today, all right? Now, let me quickly run through how simple this process can be. And I'm going to use myself uh, as an example. So you key in the details accordingly, right? Of course, for the purposes of this activity, I'm going to use a uh, uh, fake I see number, but for you, and you're doing this real writing activity, please do use a real IC number as per your IC. Yeah. Okay, and in accordingly, right? If you have children, you might want to key in. If you have no children, that's fine as well. And then 
you can key in the details of your dependents and the details of your children, okay? And let's say I have another daughter. Okay, and we can go on. So because today I have two young children minus, right, I will need to make sure that I have the guardian. So by default, the spouse will always be the default guardian. I will also need to think of who I am going to appoint as an alternative guardian. And in this case today, I will appoint my friend. Okay, uh, this is the difficult part whereby most of us will have uh, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of trouble trying to think of who is going to be a good um, replacement uh, guardian. Right. So just put somebody that you know and you think can do this job well, okay. Going forward, if you find a better uh, option, you can always log into your account and edit your will at any point in time. So by default, all of your loved ones will be the beneficiaries to your will, but for whatever reason, if you don't want to give to your children, maybe you want to leave only to your spouse, you can also uh, do that as well. And for me, I would intend, this is the easy part, right? To distribute according to how much I have, I'm going to give my spouse uh, the bulk of it because of my young children, I'm going to give them 10% uh, each. And the next page, I will need to decide who is going to carry out my will. And most likely for most of us, if we are married, we are going to choose our, our spouse as well. And definitely we need to think of who would be uh, an alternative. Okay, and I'm going to put my good friend in as well. And I'm done with my will. I took less than five minutes, yeah? So today, if you have all the information on hand, you can actually review all this information and once you are done what will happen is that you can actually download this will from your dashboard and print it out thereafter let me continue with my slide right thereafter printing out your will you will then need to find two witnesses Okay, now who should be witnesses to your will? Preferably, they should not be your, they should not be related to beneficiaries or, or the beneficiaries themselves. For sure, the beneficiaries cannot be witnesses. Okay, uh, they must definitely be above the age of 21 and of sound mind. The job of the witnesses really is to see and cite that you have you are of sound mind when you are writing the will and signing the will, okay? And uh, once you have signed and dated your will, please remember to uh, keep it in a safe place. You will then be able to, your executor will then be able to uh, retrieve it, make sure your executor knows uh, where is the location of the will as well. And back to the point that I think one of the participants had, uh, had, been, uh, had asked just now, uh, is it, recommended for you to lodge it with the will registry. Yes, you might want to consider, uh, and I will touch on this in my final part of an FAQ uh, later on, okay? Now, the money of our will will not have a schedule of assets. And what is this? Essentially, it is not a legal document, but we do recommend that after doing up your will uh, through money, our uh, will writing service, do list down all of your assets. So this could be your uh, property, okay, your bank accounts, your investment accounts, uh, and things like that, you might want to list them down and attach it to your will so that this will make the job of your executor a much easier process, okay, and um, 
it will just hasten the whole, uh, whole procedure up. Okay. Now I understand that this part, a lot of people have a lot of questions. Now, before I end off today's session, I thought it would be good for me to share some commonly asked questions uh, during our workshops as well. Now, a lot of times I get this question, do I need to bring this will that I have uh, printed out uh, with, with the Money Hour Will Writing Service, do I need to go and certify at the law firm? Okay, the answer is no, but you may want to lodge it with the will registry. So what the will registry does is that it will keep important, important information, uh, such as the details of the person writing the will, the date of the will, and the details of where this will is being kept. Okay. Um, however, the will registry does not physically hold on to your will. Now, next question would be then, where should you keep your will? Okay. Now, keep it in a safe place together with all your other important documents. For example, a fireproof safe. Now, the worst place that you can keep your will would be in your bank safe deposit box. Yeah, please do not keep your will there. Why? Because in the event of a death, your bank accounts will be frozen. And in order for your executor to get hold of your will to unlock your bank account, uh, it's as good as you not writing a will at all. It's as good as you dying in testate. So keep it in a safe place, preferably in a fireproof safe. You don't really have to lock it, right? Because the will document, it's only valid uh, when you have passed away, okay? Now, can a beneficiary be your executor? Yes, for sure. Um, the beneficiary can be an executor to the will. Uh, why? Because also, because today, if the person is going to get a share of the estate, it makes more sense and he will be more motivated to go and do the legwork for your estate as well. Now, executor, please choose carefully. You want to have a competent person, a capable person, and, and it's not an easy job. Okay, and for some of you who are listening in today, uh, you will realize if you have been through the whole process, it's not uh, an easy process as well. Now, can you have more than one will? The answer is no. Okay, the latest will will supersede all your previous testamentary disposition. Okay, and uh, previously as advised by a lawyer, you can actually have up to three copies or rather the three originals of a will. However, you can only have one will at any point in time. The last will will always stand, okay? And if you have written a new will, please destroy the previous will either by tearing or burning it. Now, a few more questions that co are commonly asked. What if you have married or you remarried? What happens to your will then? Okay, now, in most cases, marriage will revoke your will, okay? But with certain exceptions. Now, this can be quite complicated. Uh, if you have made the will in contemplation of your marriage or in an exercise of a power of appointment, okay? Then the marriage will not revoke. Now, what happens if you have divorced your spouse previously? Uh, it, will, it will be good definitely to write a new will as well because a divorce does not automatically revoke wills and nominations okay now last question how often should you review your will now you should review generally as a rule of thumb upon any change in your life stage events for example getting married getting divorced having children buying a new property and so on right so if there is a major change in your life stage definitely do consider uh, reviewing your will, all right? Now, that is all the time that I have today. Uh, and I, in fact, have overran by quite a fair bit. And thank you all for staying with us throughout uh, this evening's talk. As you guys have already realized, it is not a very simple topic at all. And if you do need more information, right, please feel free to get in touch with us for a one-to-one -one session with our client advisors, right? Or if you have more specific requests and um, needs, right? Do also write to us and we'll be happy to, to refer you to our will writing uh, service partner as well. Now, um, for those of us who are thinking about it, take this opportunity today, uh, explore our platform, our will writing service, right? And upon the completion of your will, you actually get 
uh, $5. You don't have to pay for it and you get a $5 grab food uh, voucher, right? So do check it out. I drop us a note if you have any issues pertaining to today's session or um, any problems when you are writing your will as well. And I hope I have shared sufficient information this evening for all of us to take an action, right? Um, if we haven't already written a uh, will. Now, with that, I've come to the end of today's uh, expect, uh, today's presentation. Uh, I want to thank all of us for taking time to attend today's session and hope it was a, a fruitful session for all of you. Right? And uh, keep in touch uh, with us. Follow our Facebook page for updates on any future uh, webinar sessions or even uh, live sessions as well. Right? Thank you very much. All of you, thank you. Uh, yes, we'll have, uh, this will be on our Facebook page right uh, thereafter. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And have a good evening. Bye-bye.